Well, thank you. Good morning. As I talk about beauty today, I want to talk a little bit about truth. I'm going to talk about instincts, talk about axes, and then finally, a little bit about labels that go on packaging. Um, now, I'm a designer. Uh, I absolutely love my job. It's tremendous fun every day. Uh, a great job to do. Um, one of the things I really like about being a designer is actually also how cool it sounds. So <laughs> those of you that are designers, you know if you're at a party, someone asks you what you do, and you say I'm a designer, the conversation flows very easily. Certainly flows a lot more than some professions. I always find it strange where people almost feel the need to apologise for the profession that they do. But if I'm feeling a little bit facetious, instead of saying I'm a designer, what I do is I say I make things look nice. But the more I've thought about that over the years, actually, the more I've thought, well, that is a large part of what I do, not something I should apologise for. Actually, I think it's a little bit of a noble calling. I shall try and explain why. The more I've looked at this subject of beauty and of trying to create objects of beauty, the more I've come to the conclusion um, that actually it's something that's deep within the core of our being. It's an instinct that we all have as humans and I think it's for our, our individual benefit and also potentially for our collective benefit as well. Now, it's not a subject that I hear designers talk about a great deal. There's a lot of talk about ideas, a lot of talk about form and function, um, but not many designers talk about beauty. One exception, this is an excellent TED Talk by Richard Seymour that I'd really recommend to you, where he talks about how beauty feels. I'll try not to repeat what he has said on his TED talk. But as I've researched the topic, what I've needed to do is look a little bit outside of my profession and look at the world of psychology, of art theory and art criticism, behavioural economics, and then also the, the excellent work um, of Darwinian um, theory of beauty. Uh, excellent book on the bottom right there by Dennis Dutton that's well worth a read. But before I delve into that, I'll tell you a story. Uh, and it's a story told to me by Vincent Bastien. Now, he's the former managing director of Louis, of Louis Vuitton. And he tells a story about this handbag uh, and about a two-year delay in launching it. So back in the day, suddenly orange handbags were hot property. Louis Vuitton didn't have one. But he had a very specific vision for the handbag that he wanted, more to the point, the colour of orange. He had a picture in his mind of a sunset at a favourite holiday destination, and it took 100 samples from 20 different leather manufacturers to find the right colour of orange. So when that happened, two years after the project started, he gave the green light for the orange handbag to be launched, and it was a tremendous commercial success but something that he was prepared to wait two years for to get that absolute level of perfection. Now, going back, another story, going back a long way before the invention of handbags. These are Andalusian hand axes, named after the area in France where they were first found. But they're found by their thousands all the way across Europe, through France and Spain, and across Africa. And they were made over a million years ago. So this is not Homo sapiens making these, it's our predecessors, Homo erectus, and they were making these before they had spoken language. Um, many of the ones that are found, they're, they're either very small or very big, they're of no practical use, and some of them are actually found perfect, they haven't got any chips in them. And it's a surprising thing, so what, why were Homo erectus making these lovely, beautiful, symmetrical objects? And the thinking is that it's the earliest evidence of art. They're symmetrical, they're perfect, they're demonstrating skill. They were being made because they're beautiful. So right deep within our psyche is this thought process, this instinct towards art. If you look at the early writings of many religions, you see beauty being talked about. So right at the start of Genesis of the Christian and the Jewish Bible, the Garden of Eden is described as being beautiful um, and it's described as that being good. Uh, throughout the history of design, many people have focused on this thought of, of beauty. So shaker furniture uh, is made and every detail of every part, including the parts that humans won't see, a great deal of thought has gone into it. And the shakers 
philosophy was, well, God sees it, so I'll make it beautiful. When Mies van der Rohe uh, was complimented on the Barcelona chair, he quite famously said, God is in the details. Now, we have a great deal of our um, theory about art and beauty. To, we have to look at the Greeks and the, and, the, um, uh, and the Romans to thank for that. If you look at Plato, uh, he very much equated truth with beauty and with it being evidence of some sort of higher order. Uh, and Pythagoras, we have him to thank for a lot of our maths um, that we learn. Uh, and one of his legacies is the golden section, this theory of what makes for perfect proportion. Now, interestingly, uh, some research that's been done recently has discovered that if you're in a building that's proportioned according to the principles of the golden section, it produces a sense of peace and of harmony. It kind of feels right to us as humans. And then it's also been discovered it's the same set of proportions that describes how a great deal of plants and animals grow. I'm sure you recognise the shape um, of a snail there in that drawing of the golden section. Roger Scruton, very interesting uh, man to read his books. Um, he talks about art and about beauty uh, and describes how almost throughout the entire history of Western art, beauty has been at the core of what people were trying to express. If you asked people pre-1930, what's the point of art and architecture and music and poetry? He says most people would have said that it's beauty. So all throughout the history of art, when it was mostly influenced or commissioned by the church, there was this search for the expression of the divine and equating that with beauty. And then conversely, of course, showing ugliness and equating that with the devil. But even beyond um, that period of time when um, the church no longer focused on art um, and other areas were influencing we had Kant trying to persuade people to see beauty in the everyday, and then, of course, Van Meer uh, painting images of uh, servants, quite you know, dramatically different at the time, and projecting those as being beautiful. The dandies are very interesting to look at uh, and understand. Actually, we kind of think of them as a bit of a figure of fun. Uh, Oscar Wilde said, you know, to me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It's only shallow people who don't judge by appearances. Uh, actually, he was being serious. At a time of moral decline, they were very much focusing on this idea of my life and my focus on beauty being an expression of what's inside me uh, and of being a particularly good thing. So all the way through, we see impressionists who are searching for new subjects and new ways of expressing beauty. And in the early days, um, of the Industrial Revolution. We've got Art Deco and Art Nouveau seeking to bring beauty and aesthetics and natural forms into this new industrial era. Now, we do have quite a dramatic change, um, a bit of a seminal moment, and really we've had about a hundred years worth of art that hasn't focused on beauty, the cult of ugliness, uh, as Roger Scruton describes it. So Marcel Duchamp finds a uh, a urinal puts it on the side, signs it with a fake name, places it in an art gallery and says, well, it's art because I say that it's art. And we've mostly lived through an era where art has been about challenging ideas, pushing forward notions. So Damien Hirst cuts animals in half and stores them in formaldehyde. Tracy Emin brings her unmade bed, complete with condoms and used needles, and places it into the art gallery and wins awards. Now, the design world follows, in many ways, a similar theme. You hear designers talking about problem solving, about commercial success, about ideas, and a lot less about beauty. Uh, and I think we miss out as a consequence. Of course, function is important, but for me, the idea that form follows function, it drives an almost brutal aesthetic that forgets that we are emotion beings first, not logic-based beings primarily. The commercial world gets this. So luxury products companies know and understand that if you make something of supreme beauty, I'm sure we've all experienced that, that is lovely, I want it, and then later thought about and tried to justify the price um, <laughs> that the item uh, is. Uh, you look at uh, the, the luxury world, how they do their fashion 
shows. They're, they're much more art installations, really, than they are fashion shows. Uh, and the automotive world really understands this. I can't look at this image and not feel a completely irrational sense of desire. Uh, they really understand the power and beauty of sculptural form. And it isn't just the luxury cars that do this. At pretty much every level uh, of car design, there's this appreciation for sculpture uh, and amazing beauty. Just look at what uh, an amazing and inspiring art gallery and a beautiful building did for Bill Bauer and how that was at the heart of regenerating what was a dying post-industrial city and is now on most people's agendas to want to go and visit. And Hollywood really deeply understands the power of beauty and how to commercialise uh, and sell and make a very powerful industry out of that. Now, uh, there are a couple of things people often say to me when I talk about beauty uh, in this way. They say, hang on, my mum told me, don't judge a book by its cover. Actually, you probably should judge books by their cover. The publishing world knows that we do, so they pour huge design value into expressing everything that that book is about through the design of the cover. And as humans, we've got a couple of heuristics, mental shortcuts, ways of getting us through the day that may or may not actually help us make the right judgments. If you haven't read Thinking Fast and Slow, I'd really recommend that book. It will actually change your life because of the insights it gives you into the way that you think and operate. So we have a couple of mental shortcuts as humans. We do assume that something that is beautiful is good. And there's the halo effect. We think that if there's one quality that's good, we assume that everything else uh, is going to be good as well. And as designers, we have to be careful about that. Uh, you know, we've got the ability to create beautiful objects. Uh, this is a bottle of whiskey that costs £100,000. And of course, we've poured a huge amount of value into the decanter and all of the materials that go around that. If the product itself doesn't deliver, there's such an incredible letdown. You're very unlikely to ever trust me again with a product that I might be trying to sell you. Now, uh, one of the most common things people say about beauty is they go, oh, hang on a second, surely beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Uh, I was just chatting about that with one of my fellow speakers this morning, and, and quite rightly, you brought that question up. Surely it's something that's culturally conditioned. And, and you might think so. Actually, the more I've looked at this subject, the more I've thought, I'm not sure that that is the case. Now, there's one area where there's good scientific evidence of, of, of how beauty can be quite subjective. If you're in love with someone, you are likely to find them about 20% more attractive than the average population will find that person. So you'll look at this picture, you'll think, what a beautiful woman. Uh, I'll find her at least 20% more attractive than you because that's my wife. She is beautiful uh, and I love her, so of course I'll find her more attractive. But apart from that, we're actually remarkably consistent in our grading or views as to how beautiful people are. Almost wherever you go around the world, people will grade people in a similar way in terms of relative attractiveness. Um, there are cultural nuances, there are slight differences, but ultimately best sellers tend to sell wherever you go around the world. If you look at Shakespeare, it's been translated into almost every language that's ever been written down, and it's universally appreciated as very much high art. And fascinatingly, there's one universally appealing landscape. Now, um, that landscape that you see before you is appealing, whether you're brought up in the UK and have luscious fields all around you, or whether you've never personally come across a landscape like this. So even if you've grown up surrounded by desert or ice, um, this sort of landscape where you've got grassland that sort of raises up into areas of bushes and trees, there's water there, there's some sort of path that leads you to a distance, there's evidence of life, of, of, of animal life there, it's almost universally appealing. Um, now, as I was reading about this, I thought, hang on a second, that's really familiar um, as a landscape, and it's from a brand that I've had the pleasure uh, of working on. Hands up, I had no idea of this when we were uh, developing this product um, and taking what was an already existing landscape and kind of working it, but it's just a fascinating coincidence for me that the creators of Bailey's created this landscape that is universally appealing all the way around the world. 
So beauty, we've got this really deep uh, instinctive appreciation for it. It touches our soul at really quite a deep level. Um, it does, of course, bring commercial success. It's absolutely critical uh, that we link the beauty of the product to the function and the performance of it because it taps into this really deeply held human instinct. It must perform. And of course, the function can be beautiful every much, every, every much as much as the object is beautiful to have a look at. We are not ultimately logic-based beings. We might like to think that we are, but actually it's our emotions that make us human. After all, we fall in love. We admire, we dream, and we aspire, and we respond really in our gut to beauty. So I'll close with a quote um, that, that's famous, and I think it's famous and it's lasted a long time, uh, after the era in which it was written, because it resonates so much to us, uh, of, of having objects and creating objects that are both useful and beautiful. Um, and probably with a plea, I'll go back to my supposedly noble calling. Let's make things look nice. Thank you. Thank you.